the uh, the UFO researchers in the audience will yell at me if I don't ask this question. Okay. Would the glints be consistent with a highly reflective saucer? Oh, of course. I think that's the best explanation so far. So. Well, you know that it just it's just too weird, and that the the umbra. So I'm going to co- I'm going to be completely straight. Okay. I do think that, that these are artificial objects in a high orbit when they shouldn't be any objects. I do think that. I had myself a proper shock when I've been working with these results and redoing over and over. I it's just like first you don't want to believe it. You just say something has to be wrong with the calculation. You redo it, and then but you you will start feeling in the body that like. It seems to really hold up no matter how we change like and the routine, no matter how we like try different maskings, removing the edges of the plate and all kind of things. And it's still the deficit stays there. And that's when I had a what's called an ontological shock. My own philosophy, though, is that what is is. And yeah. if you can demonstrate your methodology and everything which you did in the papers, it is. That's it. Yeah, so we will make the samples uh, public soon, as soon as we have like a decision about the papers, or, or uh, we will maybe try to resubmit once more somewhere if it doesn't work the first time. But we will make the samples public. The code is already public. Everyone can just go in then and try to reproduce it themselves. And if they don't like our samples, they can do the new extraction of transients themselves from the. Everything is public. All can be done. I suspect that the that this uh, the visit in the umbra will stay no matter what one does. And that also eliminates a lot of people have, have, have mentioned to me. They say, "Well, how do you know that it's not the digitization process and that there are artifacts from that of that course. wouldn't correlate this strongly with the umbra? It just yeah, it, it should be." And random. even if you have ninety percent of defects there, let's say now, just we can play with that idea. You have ninety percent of defects there, and ten percent is something else that you don't know what it is. Still. If you have a deficit in the umbra, you still have an important fraction of objects that are reflective. It's just that the, the amount of them might differ. Maybe you will not have 30%, maybe you will have 5% that are, that's statistically significant. I think it, it doesn't really matter. It's just if you have the deficit itself, then it gets really, really, really interesting. Yeah. Of course, I would prefer to find out that it's fewer objects than that it's too many. True, true. Now, one glaring thing about looking at these old photographic plates is what's called the Menzel Gap in the Harvard plates. This is separate from the Palomar plates. Is the Menzel Gap where Dr. Donald Menzel, who was the head of the Department of Astronomy at the time, destroyed, willfully destroyed a bunch of survey plates for no reason. And I've never been able to track down exactly what his thinking was because they're just plates sitting around Mm -hmm. and there was a another scientist at the time dort hofflight Mm -hmm. that was hiding plates in her office to keep them away from menzel tell us that story so he wanted to destroy a lot of plates so so menzel himself he was one of the main he was the number one top uh ufo debunker and he was also the one that was employed by the, is it called employed in English or? Yes, I think so. Uh, employed by the um, US Air Force to help debunking the Washington 1950, 1952 UFO flap. So they used his arguments to try to say that, you know, everything was wrong, what people saw, what the witnesses saw was wrong, what the pilots saw that was confusions and what the radar operators that was incompetence, you know, weather phenomena, et cetera, et cetera. So Mansell helped the U.S. Air Force to debunk this big event. And two months after, he becomes director of Harvard Observatory. And as a first thing, he asks his secretary to go and throw away or remove or whatever one third of the photographic plates. And as far as I understand, also a lot of logbooks were destroyed and Dorit Hofflight, she tried to save some of the plates in her office. And after that, she fell out of grace with Mansell, who started making her life very difficult. So she eventually had to move to a different observatory. So she has this chapter called Persona non grata. I learned, by the way, that Mansell and Clyton Bow that you mentioned, 
also weren't the best friends. Mansell was kind of not very kind to Clyde Tombeau when it came to his UFO sightings. And by the way, Clyde, I th wasn't he, I, I might misremember this, but wasn't he actually also searching for satellites around the Earth, like small satellites? I don't know. In the early 50s. I don't know, but I, Yeah, I I think do know so. that Clyde Tombaugh had seen a UFO that puzzled him in, I think, Las Cruces, New Mexico. And he, he was, after that, very much interested. Now, remember, this is the guy that discovered Pluto, the astronomer that did that. Yeah. And he also had a colleague, Lincoln La Paz, another astronomer, that, that also was keenly interested. And there was a history, sort of, of none of them getting along with Menzel. But I have never known, and I've known, I must know 100 astronomers at this point, and I have never known an astronomer that would destroy data. Not one. Except for Menzel. Except for Menzel. He's the only one I've ever heard. Otherwise, the astronomers would protect those plates at all costs. Well, look at the Vatican, their, their plate collection. They, I mean, I don't even let you near them, you know? Amazing. Um, whereas, uh, not here. You know, not in this case. What other plate sets can you look at to try to verify this outside of uh, Palomar? So this is something I've been thinking about. Of course, I mean, it's one thing if we replicate the study, but it's much stronger if some other group replicates the study, because that's always going to be a much better proof, More robust, I think, yeah. if it's someone independently. So imagine something that would be really beautiful. If, because these plates, plate archives, they probably are suffering from lack of budget very often. They are expensive to store, and if you store them wrongly, then they degrade. So they are expensive to store. Many don't care about the photographic plates from 100 years ago. They say, oh, I mean, we have our CCD surveys today. We see so much more. This is not so important for science anymore. It becomes almost a historical thing for observatories to take care of. But look, these plates are gold for artifact searches and for UFO searches. Now imagine each country, each government would give to their plate collection, because somewhere in every country there's probably a plate collection, they would give them $500,000 or euros or whatever, and they would ask them to d digitize everything and ask them to perform some diagnostic test, like the Umbra test, to see if they also get transients, how many they get on their, on their photographs, and also diffraction that can be found in the Umbra. Maybe there will be some that find nothing, but maybe there will be several of them that will uh, yield huge deficits. And that could be so incredibly important for us. This would be invaluable information. And maybe these old plates, photographic plates, would in that case provide much more important information than most, than most CCD surveys do today. Just to note, I think this will want to happen. just to note, there was, uh, you know, there's there are other reasons um, besides looking for artifacts. There are other reasons to look at these old astronomical plates and preserve them. And one example that comes to mind was back when people were trying to figure out Tabby Star, KIC 8462852. Yes. They were trying to figure that out. They went back and looked at plates, even as early as 1890 from the Vatican. Yes. And they were trying to see what the brightness of this was. And they were able to establish using a number of plates that it was, it's been varying in brightness for over a century. And that was all done through archived old photographic plates. There you see, this is like invaluable information. And I find it's very concerning that, that people might not care for these collections. And think about Mansell, he goes, he went and threw away so many and he even stopped astronomers from looking at the sky for 15 years later. I also know Someone told me, I cannot say or reveal anyone's source or so, but someone also told me that he had a second episode of plate destruction of unidentified objects. But later in the 60s, I haven't been able to confirm this yet, but that's the rumor. You know, just just off offhand, I wonder what the method of destruction was, because photographic plates of that period, that's silver Mm -hmm. emulsion. So, you know, people would normally try to reclaim that silver. And I remember that was a thing that was going up into the uh, into the 2000s, 1990s and 2000s, where people were buying industrial yeah. photographic plates from that period and scrapping them for silver. I wonder if he did that and tried to recover the cost, because one of the things he said was he was trying to cost cut. Well, why wouldn't you reclaim it? But if he was just throwing them out, then that wouldn't make sense. Really. What if you shipped them away? 
to some secret vault. They're they're sitting in the 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 U.S. government's giant Indiana Jones warehouse next to the next to the Ark. That's the other thing is that I mean, what if there was a national security reason? And they're like, yeah, we need these, and that's where they went. But I'd love to know. It could be. Uh, Doris wouldn't know that. No, I don't. I didn't get. I, I didn't get the uh, the sense from her book that uh, mm-hmm. she was all that much into the loop. She was just hiding them. And Menzel actually moved yeah. her office next to the men's room <laughs> to, try to, to try to create problems for. Her. It was, it's actually an amazing story. Yeah, and later she she also got sacked from writing some essays later in some popular journal. Right, I remember something like that. Or I might do I confuse it? There was some popular astronomy journal, and she wasn't any more invited to write there. I probably mis- misremember it. Yeah, and after Menzel, um, I guess passed away, or whatever. The skeptic after that was Philip Class, the arch skeptic. Yes, and he completely destroyed Dr. James McDonald's career yes. over his interest in UFOs. It was it's amazing what what what's happened and how sorted the history of this is of just open inquiry into into the subject and it, i just don't understand that level of stigma yeah that is because there is this um, it, the topic has been so stigmatized for a long time that people many people react with a reflex i mean they react with emotion so if they will make an analysis it's going to be driven by emotion rather than asking than rather than curiosity and even maybe the the debunkers maybe sometimes also have this thing that they not all i'm sure there are good debunkers too that are like going in very doing very solid work but some might have this thing of that it has to be wrong this cannot be right so they maybe maybe the same thing with mcdonald that he and class they really uh, maybe he triggered something in class that class became very aggressive on him it's yeah. Well, the the funny thing about class was that in one of his books, he uh, he uh, actually posited that it's all ball lightning, all of it. It's all plasmas, all ball lightning. That's true. But now in our modern age, we know that's not true, not necessarily. And so his his actual debunk is it was wrong, but it was also very hand wavy and dismissive, which I, I don't think you can apply that because there's just such a wide variance in what people see. You yeah. know, when they see something they can't identify in the sky. But what I wonder is if that you're actually seeing it. Let's do a thought experiment. Let's say somehow, and I know this physically is a problem, but we'll we'll say it. If someone saw dark matter phasing into brief visible, <laughs> you know, somehow becomes visible, would the brain interpret that? How do it would it interpret it? I mean, would it see a UFO today and? Five centuries ago, it would see something else because it doesn't know what it's looking at, like an optical illusion. And I wonder about that. Are we seeing these things as they actually are? What do you think about that? I think we don't. I think we very often see the things as we imagine them in a certain moment. And not only we see, uh, it's, I think it's applicable on everything that we do, the, the interpretation and so on. If we, if we cannot imagine a phenomenon we might have difficult time both detecting it, observing it, interpreting it, analyzing it, experimenting with it. We might have no idea what to do with it. That would, ex- that would explain things like, like uh, Dr. Jacques Vallée's work, that you know, your interpretation of it is, is what varies. And people from different cultures and different time periods would see something different. They would interpret it differently. Just like how people would interpret the aurora borealis. I know that Chinese astronomers uh, during the Tang Dynasty said it looks like billowing silk, which it actually it kind of does. But they also would say, I mean, they would call it supernova, guest star, you know, things like that, because they didn't know the context. And I wonder if this is something that we just don't know the context and how to actually interpret it. It's super difficult to do research when you don't understand the context. You you might try to analyze it in some way, but until after, when you actually got the complete context, then it's then it's going to be so much easier, of course, to analyze something. But until then, I think uh, that's one of the problems with the anomaly science. You see an anomaly, but you might not understand the context of it. So you try to target the experiment in one way, 
And I think that this is what happens with a lot of this UFO research. People see some anomaly and they try to study it. And let's say, I don't know, if, or if they see a ghost, they might also try to study it. But maybe it's not a ghost, maybe it's something else. And it, just because they call it a ghost, it will immediately, the experiment will be flawed. So I, I think it's it's so challenging with the anomaly research. It's so different from the more orthodox things where you have lots of people who are developing protocols for doing a certain thing exactly. I will quote two people. Yeah. And the first is Arthur C. Clarke. Any sufficiently advanced technology would be indistinguishable from magic, which makes it very difficult to you know understand something that you you don't have any experience with and the second is and J. Allen Hynek famously said in response to this is that a lot of people have the attitude that it can't be therefore it isn't exactly so if they see something that looks now and this this can't be then it must be then it must be like just imagined or so and I think it's a dogmatic attitude it is and then of course you will quote Occam's razor which is very dangerous to do. I have problems with Occam's razor because sometimes the simplest answer isn't the most likely. I mean, often it is, but sometimes it's not. You know, I don't think that, you know, what would be the simplest answer to explain what the sun is? Well, you're probably not going to say a giant ball of nuclear fusion with <laughs> all this complicated solar physics going on. You're going to say that's a god, you know, as people used to do. But that would be the simplest answer is that it's the sun god. You exactly. Know, but, exactly. So it, it wasn't the simplest answer. All right, Dr. Villarreal, it's always a pleasure talking to you, and I look forward to further research. What's next in searching these plates? Well, I would be super interested in uh, seeing if we can get some help from other plate archives, let's say like the Vatican, to see if we can reproduce the finding with Umbra. So I think that's next. We're also waiting for answers from peer review, where I, I assume we're going to get lots of feedback on the experiment and I guess maybe we will keep on exploring these interesting correlations because what we want to do is to see if we can clean up the sample of the transients and get like minimize the number of false detections there. That's something we want to do because if we do that maybe we will get, who knows, it's, it's possible that we will get stronger correlations between let's say, let's say the nukes and the transients if we have better samples. So that's next, accepting this big challenge, <laughs> so. Big challenge, but it's interesting. I mean, it's, also, it's I, I'm particularly blown away by the Umbra because I can't think of any other way that could happen if, if, if it wasn't simply the earth blocking the light. I mean, I just can't think of any physical, anything that could mimic that. Exactly, exactly. And I don't think it's balloons, sorry. I don't think so either. <laughs> I don't know what it is, though. Uh, it's a complete mystery. Mm. All right, Doctor, thank you for joining us today, and I look forward to more, more shows in the future. Thank you. It was a pleasure to join, as always.